Welcome to DevNet Create. My name is Matthias Madu, and for the next 20 minutes, I would like to talk about how can we play to win with security champions and coaches. Let's be honest, we need really good people to push the security train forward into our organizations, and we definitely need champions and coaches. And I think it's especially necessary in terms of development, if we talk to development teams, and we have to get the developers on board with security, well, then we need really good champions and coaches. My name is Matthias Madu, and I'm the co-founder and CTO of Secure Code Warrior. Um, over here, you can see my business partner, Peter Danyu. We started roughly five, six years ago with Secure Code Warrior, and I actually have a history of static analysis. Um, I used to work at a static analysis vendor, but one day I realized it is all too easy to find problems in code if you never ever tell the developer how to write secure code in the first place. But that's all about tooling. As I said in the introduction, well, we also really need to make sure that the people are engaged. You will not solve the problem with tools only. Tools will point out problems. Tools can help you, but ultimately it's the people that need to fix code and the people need to write code securely from the start. So the agenda for today, um, I would like to, to talk a little bit about the application security's secret weapon. Would like to briefly touch on the champions and the coaches. Um, I would like to talk about how to inspire developers um, and to share the responsibility of security. Ultimately, you can say, well, you know what? There's a security department in our organization, so these people are um, uh, responsible for security. Well, the actual truth is maybe a little bit different. I would like to touch on um, DevSecOps um, for people who did not see my presentation last year. Um, I extensively talked about DevSecOps last year, and I would like to wrap it up. Leaders, coaches, champions, it all starts with the people. So what is the secret weapon in an organization, and especially when it comes down to security? Let's dig a little bit into the numbers. If we look at security, well, on average, there's one security person per 10 operations, per, per 10 operations people per 100 developers, which means that one security person ultimately in this new world with, with DevOps, well, they have to help roughly 110 operations and developer people to get code securely into production. And even that is strange because as an application security person, you can point out problems, but guess where those problems are and where they need to be fixed? Well, they all need to be fixed in code, right? And quite often application security people do not have access to code in a sense that they can update the code. Maybe they, don't, they do not even have the knowledge how to do that properly and the way the, the, way the developers are doing it. So we really need to engage with the developers if we want to fix this security problem at, at the core. Um, ultimately, you know, we can say, well, it all starts with code. Um, we're building code on top of code. Yes, the application security people can build a couple walls around that code um, in a sense of firewalls and other um, solutions. But ultimately, that's again bits building on top of bits to protect bits. So, I would argue that we have to look at the core of the problem and not smack the developers, but actually help them and make sure they can do their job better. We help them do their job better, right? So what is the secret weapon um, for application security people? Well, I think the, the secret weapon for application security people is to be able to engage with developers, make sure um, they understand why this is important and we all, um, fight the same battle, which is trying to get code into production in a secure way. Last but not least, why do we think that this can be successful? Well, I'm genuinely um, convinced that developers want to do the right thing. Um, they are problem solving people. Um, and, you know, quite often they, they like some games, gamification. So I do think with the with the right tools, with the, with the right training, we're able um, to engage with those developers and make sure they get a passion for security and they wanna do the right thing and they can produce secure code. So champions, coaches, what's the difference? 
So let's have a look at, at where this all comes from. And I was actually fortunate to be part of the BSIM, Building Security In, which is a maturity model. By the way, this, you know, you can also look at OpenSAM or, or Axway. Um, Axway, I was um, uh, uh, able to interview Brian Levine from Axway on the Software Security Gurus webcast, and he talked about the maturity model they had within Axway. So no matter how you do it, make sure you have a maturity model, make sure it fits, fits your organization, it fits your processes. I was lucky enough to be part of the BSIM where we ran around in Europe and we interviewed 10 people in charge of application security or security in general in fairly large organizations like SAP and Nokia, Visa. That was 10 years ago. One thing that we saw at that time was successful organizations had one thing in common and unsuccessful organizations also had one thing in common. Successful organizations all had something called a satellite. They bridged out of their central group and they were able to engage with the teams with one specific person in each team, coach that person, help that person and make sure security was on top of mind of those people in those teams. That was in general, the success um, of successful programs in these organizations. And of course, unsuccessful companies, people that really struggled with getting application off the ground, they, didn't, they did not have that. These days, we're talking more about champions. We, want, we, we, we must have champions and so on and so forth. So in the next couple of slides, I would like to talk a little bit on how to identify these people. How can you work with them? Um, and, and essentially, how can you make that program successful. But first, let's have a quick look at what other people say that security champions are, because quite often there's a little bit of confusion, well, confusion what security champions are. Um, but quite often they generally, generally agree that a security champion has to provide guidance and assistance to the developers. They should encourage security best practices and they should advocate for the team, essentially help them upwards and also downwards. One thing that there is a little bit of confusion and although everybody is on the same page over here is um, most people say it doesn't stop with the security person. The security person helps the developers but also want to make sure that these developers become security savvy and the knowledge is spread in the team. Others are saying no, it actually stops with the security champion. That is the person that holds the key to the kingdoms to the kingdom, well, ultimately that person is security aware and it is his responsibility. He holds the knowledge. It really, it shouldn't really be brought out to the team, but that person has to make sure they deliver secure code. Of course, I strongly disagree with that last point. I think in general, a security champion has to be somebody that brought out the, the knowledge into the team so that everybody can do the right thing. So that is what, what's out there in the market. And um, how do I look at it myself? Well, for me, a security champion is really somebody that has an active connection with the application security team, just like what I saw 10 years ago with BSIM and the satellite. Um, it is a person that has a strong connection to the application security team, but still sits with the developers. That person can advocate for the, the developer, you know, that person um, um, needs to listen to the developers, but also needs to listen um, to the application security team and actually needs to bridge between those two, two, two teams. Um, they should be able to communicate in their language because security and developers, they talk a different language. They should be able to translate security requirements into developer speak, and they should be able to translate developer speak to the security team. What are coaches? Well, that can be the same person, but it does not necessarily have to be the same person. Um, but the, the, the coach over here is really somebody that makes sure that we also deliver on the outcomes, that we do not derail from original goal. We have to make sure that the coach makes sure that the team really delivers functionality, everything, but with security in mind. The coach is able to strategize around um, the, the technology as well. So yes, security is important, 
but you know there's always a fine balance between security and performance for example so the coach really has to understand and has to have deep understanding of the security frameworks the possibilities of that security framework it has to be able to make decisions or work with the security champion to come up with with a good solution and last but not least, well, the coach should be able again to, to manage upwards and downwards and make sure um, that we meet our goals, but we meet our goals in a secure manner. So where are we today? Well, a lot of organizations have something, uh, something called the security champions program, but not everybody is there. Again, first time that we saw that was 10 years ago. We saw being a, a satellite being built out into organizations. It, it's actually curious to me that only 10% in 2017 had a security champions program. But as you can see, Gartner project, projects that by 2021, which is right now, 35% of the enterprises um, should have a security champions program or will have a security champions program. The only thing I can say is I agree. In the market, we see more and more organizations willing to build out a security champions program. How can we inspire developers and how can we share the responsibility of security? Well, first of all, we have to ask ourselves, is it working? And if it is working, we do not have to change anything. Um, unfortunately, well, if we look at a couple lists, for example, the OWASP top 10, and by the way, the OWASP 2021 came out and yeah, a couple things moved, a couple categories moved up and down, but ultimately it was roughly the same top 10 so over the last, gosh, 14 years now, we always have roughly the same top 10 of vulnerabilities. How is that possible? Well, I, I have my own theory. I think 10, 15 years ago, let's say 15 years ago, we started with pen testing and we said, well, you know what? We find these individual problems. Can we find more of these things? And then we moved on to static analysis because static analysis could find whole heaps of the same problem and then we found whole heaps of the same problem and realized oh my god how are we going to fix that so we didn't really fix it but we started to baseline our applications meaning well we said well you know what we have a certain number of problems let's keep it at the same level not a good idea right the idea of like well we know it's broken but we're not going to touch it but it still works and um, so ultimately my advice over here is make your own top 10, maybe make your own top three, maybe top one, and you know, do it really, really good. Um, make sure you kill that category of problems in your entire organization, learn from that experience and replicate that. And the first example I would like to give is really show why we're still in that endless loop, why the number one problem is still the same number one problem, or it tickles down a little bit and up and down in that OWASP top 10 list, but it's not changing. Here is a real example. Let's say your static analysis or your dynamic analysis or your pen testers or your um, EAST finds a particular problem. Well, that problem is going to be filed in the bird tracking system. A developer will um, do some research, figure out well, what is the problem. Okay, that is the problem. How do I fix that problem? Okay, I'm going to fix that problem. And ultimately, that developer is going to check in some code that resolves the problem. At that moment in time, something magical is happening. You know what is happening? The code is fixed, but the knowledge disappears into a black hole because nobody else knows about that particular solution. We close the bug and it's never, ever looked at again. That is very unfortunate. And if tomorrow a new person comes on board, that person does not know about the particular fix, right? So it's, it's easy, even almost natural to introduce similar problems because they were not thought in school how to develop code properly. And because nobody told that developer on, on how to write code properly and nobody told that developer um, about previous fixes, well, guess what? It's going to reappear. So we're in, in this endless cycle. Okay, so how can you break out of that endless cycle? Well, I think we have to align all our objectives, the company objectives. Um, we need to align that with the department objectives. We need to align that with the personal objectives and also for security. 
because right now I see all too often the objective of security, find as many problems as possible. Well, that is unfortunately not an objective that can be aligned with the company objective because the company objective should be to make reliable software that your customers have trust in your applications and they have trust in what you're doing and they should say, well, I'm happy to use their app, I'm happy to use their website, I'm happy to use their software and I'm confident that I will not break down. That is ultimately the objective of the organization with software. If that tickles down to um, uh, the, the, the departments, well, in terms of developers, yes, the functionality have to be um, um, okay, but that's a natural one. But, you know, the department goal should also be like, if it has to be reliable, we need to take um, security into consideration. And that has to align with the personal goal of a developer, which is, hey, the only good code in an organization that can be written is security savvy code, you know, is code free of problems because that is how I'm going to help um, the end goal of that organization, which is shipping reliable code. So who is your security champion? So he is key to scaling um, your security program. It has to be a, 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 a positive person. It has to be more than just a technical strong person. The person has to have um, communication skills. It ha the person has to have this interpersonal relationships with the developers on the team and should be able to explain something, help people. Um, so the person, you know, does not have to only be passionate about security, but the person really has to be able to explain something to other developers. Um, so the security champion does not have to be the most skilled person. That is a very important one. We do not, we are not looking for the most senior person on the team and make that the security champion quite often. It is a person that is not too junior, not too senior, who has a strong interest in security that will become your champion. So how do you find your champion? Well, a good way to find your champion is to organize something security related, but which is a little bit fun. For example, you can run a tournament and I know there's a tournament running right now. So if you have an interest in, in, in security, you can join such a tournament and it's a good way to get yourself familiar with writing secure code. You learn something. You also can reflect on yourself. What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? What do I know today? What do I not know today? And ultimately, um, you, can, you can win some prizes in a tournament. So that's a good way for a security team to already identify people that have an interest in security. Just people joining have an interest in security. Okay. Now it comes down to identify the people that also um, have empathy towards other developers and can really help your um, uh, security program be pushed forward. So how can we engage with developers? Um, well, we have to make sure we then, as, as uh, vendors, we have to make sure that our solutions appeal to developers. Um, security is quite often perceived as boring, not all too fun, so we have to make sure we package that and we make sure it is interesting. It helps the developer. At the same time, the developer doesn't get a free ride. The developer should make sure that he or she understands that, you know, a security, a secure developer is normally highly sought after, has more opportunities in life. And a security savvy developer quite often is the same as um, a senior developer, somebody that understands code, somebody that reached the end of the development learning process and said, oh my God, people are misusing my code. That is quite interesting. How did they do that? Last but not least, some tips and tricks um, for effective developer upskilling. How do you do that? Well, the honest truth is you have to do that in the language and the framework that you're, do, that you're using on a day-to-day -day basis. It does not make sense to learn something in Java if you're using .NET on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, you have to make sure that um, um, if you want to upskill yourself and you're using real code and you're using real vulnerabilities and you're also using real patterns on how to fix problems, well, you have to make sure um, that the level is accurate as well. If you're a junior developer, well, you have to make sure that these um, uh, modules uh, appeal to junior developers equally for senior developers. So there's a lot on here where you say, hey, these are tips and tricks for effective developer upskilling. 
Valsman at least I said, hey, you know what? Embracing DevSecOps for developers. Um, I did give a talk last year, which I'm quickly going through on how you can embed security in, in, in DevOps. And I use the framework called comms. And please check it out. My recording is there from last year on how to embed security in DevOps. The bottom line is you have to make sure that um, uh, you work on the culture, the automation, the measurement, and the sharing. That's how you embed security um, into the DevOps cycle and essentially make it DevSecOps. To wrap it up, what do we need? Well, we need people. We need good people. We do not only need tools. Without the people, this is not going to work. It's all about the people. It's all about the culture in an organization. And, and clearly, Cisco is on the right track here, given that I'm up on stage talking about security for developers means that we care about security and that we care about the end solution here, which is shipping reliable code. Do you want to improve your secure coding skills? Well, right now we're actually running a global tournament with big prizes. You can pick your favorite language and framework um, and you can jump in and you can actually win some prizes. With that, I would like to thank you very much. And if there are questions, well, there are various ways to reach me. Thank you very much.